um, welcome everyone uh, to today's uh, webinar um, on rethinking model monitoring. We will be recording the webinar and it will be available afterwards as well. Uh, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A tab and we, would, we will answer them throughout the webinar. Um, so let, let me start with a, a brief intro of myself. My, my name is uh, Krishna Ram. I am the chief scientist at uh, Fiddler AI, uh, which is an enterprise startup working on model performance management, model monitoring, explainability, fairness, and so on. Um, so I have been at uh, Fiddler for a little over seven months. And before that, uh, I led responsible AI efforts at uh, uh, Amazon, AWS, machine learning teams, and prior to that at Microsoft Research and LinkedIn. Uh, Shreya, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, I'm Shreya, excited to be here. I am a PhD student in databases at UC Berkeley. I'm affiliated with Skylab, Epic Lab, and then the Data Systems and Foundations Group. I work primarily on ML observability research, um, projects in kind of uh, monitoring, data validation, um, and also interfaces for debugging. Um, so excited to be here and chat. Oh, fantastic. It's really great to have uh, Shreya join us today. Um, so let's, let me start with a basic question. Uh, what do we mean when we say use the term model monitoring? Well, I think different people mean different things. Um, I think the bottom line that everybody is facing is that they want some SLAs to be met. Um, so maybe if there's a pipeline to predict click-through rate, um, the click-through rate is at least some number. Otherwise, the organization needs to go and debug something. Um, so I think that's what people mean by model monitoring. So whether there is a model, whether you're directly monitoring the model or you're monitoring like the data quality or something else, um, I feel like I, I think it's more productive to focus on the like business-specific metrics um, of some minimum. I don't know chosen metric to be met. So, so that's great. Um, if, you, if you think in terms of metrics, uh, even with traditional software, there are several metrics, right? metrics on maybe latency or throughput or other uh, right, right, failures and so on. Like in, in what ways are uh, the machine learning models any different? Why don't we just use, say, everything we have done uh, over the last several decades for traditional software systems? Um. Well, like using only latency, like latency is different from, I I'm curious like what, I, I think there are new metrics in MLM that are like accuracy or things that require some ground truth label. Um, so the way that I like to think about it is like an aggregation over a join in the ML land where you're joining like some predictions or some output model outputs and some ground truth, whether you wanna call that labels or you wanna call that feedback or whatever. Um, I think that's the key difference between like the ML monitoring space and then like software monitoring space where it's like an aggregation over some uh, single vector. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's definitely a key dif difference, right? Um, so I was uh, taking a look at your uh, recent uh, vision paper, right? the paper titled uh, Towards Observability for Production Machine Learning Pipelines. Um, so one of the things um, you highlight is like, even say the machine learning pipelines differ from the traditional softwares, even with respect to when they break or, right, or when they fail. Can you maybe elaborate uh, on, on, on that aspect? Yeah, um, so one thing I've noticed in a bunch of like collaborations and then also experience before the PhD um, is that you, because of this label delays or feedback delays, um, or the, because of the need to perform a join where you're joining on two streams of information that come in at different times, um, you don't quite know when your pipeline breaks. Um, if you are deploying some model and then you only get labels like credit card fraud detection, great example of like they only get labels like on every few weeks or month or so. Um, yeah, like they just, they don't know when the pipelines break. And if they want to make that a priority, they have to think about other proxies to figure out when these pipelines break. Um, and I think that's very different from software in that like, if there's a quantity you want to measure, right, it doesn't require the join that I'm talking about, like latency, for example, I can measure that. I have all the information at any given point in time, um, throughput, whatever. Um, I, I, does that answer your question? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I, I think that's that's uh, uh, an important uh, difference, right? Like I think that that's uh, somewhat unique to uh, machine learning systems in the sense that the, yeah. the machine learning models are making predictions, and uh, the the truth, the ground truth, is often delayed, and in some cases it may not even be available until several months after. Um, so the the other difference you, you, you talk about is in terms of. Uh, machine learning models being very forgiving right like like say if you change if the data gets corrupted still like the models often continue making predictions uh, so maybe is that is that also something yeah okay of? i see so the yeah so they're not just the when so like ml pipeline bugs are really different right like because of the when is how i say like oh we don't know when pipelines break and then the why also is different right it's like um, the pipelines are very complex. Imagine you have multiple components. And as you say, right, the model part is forgiving. You give it any data, if you don't do any validation, it will spit some number out. Um, there won't, there will be silent bugs all over the place. And I think like the very old technical debt paper says like changing something, changing, changing anything changes everything. I think it's the principle of like, I change one component in the pipeline, the distribution of downstream outputs will be different. Like silently um and i think that's one nature of bugs in ml pipelines that doesn't always occur um, in software pipelines so that's the why and then there's also the like how um how how in reaction or like when you want to react to these ml bugs um that's very different in traditional software approaches where um in ml pipelines there's like a number of things that you can do always do to improve ML performance. Mm -hmm. um, you can uh, retrain a model, you can do better pre-processing, you can reject more uh, fe corrupted features. Uh, there, there are all these different tools that tricks that you have up your sleeve, but they all have different various impacts on how much they will improve, if they will even improve mm -hmm. downstream performance, right? There's like a concept of also improving one model if you have multiple models in a pipeline can cause a regression in intent. Um, so I think like the finicky, the causal nature of like, if I change something, will it help? How much will it help? Where's the best place to invest my resources? All in the like vein of reacting to bugs that also feels very different than in software land. Yeah, yes, I, I, th I think that's that's a really uh, a, uh, interesting and subtle aspect. Right? Like the in in many re real world machine learning systems, it's it's not as though the textbook examples right, where there is a standalone machine learning model. There is maybe some training data set. You train the model, deploy it. Uh, so, uh, see if you take even say uh, systems like let's say uh, social feed ranking, right? Facebook ranking, LinkedIn ranking, TikTok ranking, and so on. Uh, there are often several models stitched together, right? Uh, say, uh, like I'm, I'm more familiar with the LinkedIn, so maybe I can I can just give an example. Uh, if you if you look at the way LinkedIn feed is uh, ranked, there are heterogeneous types of items. There may be uh, some items which may be more like news. Some might be ads. Uh, some might be job recommendations, people recommendations, and so forth. And each of these is obtained by a respective model. There is a model that ranks the jobs, job postings and decides what, are, what is the ranked order of job recommendations, uh, similarly like uh, for ads and so forth. And then if you take even the job model, uh, that itself benefits from upstream models which take an individual's profile or job posting and identify what are the titles or what are the skills uh, in this job um, and so forth. So, so there are so many machine learning models being stitched together. Yeah. Uh, how do we like? How do we even go about monitoring su such systems? Totally, totally. I all great segue into a thing that I've outlined in the vision paper in terms of. Um, how do you, I think the way that I like to think about this question is suppose every model is a node in some sort of data flow graph. Um, and these data flow graphs could be quite complex. And the challenge is every node here has changes over time, like the inputs and outputs to these nodes, like data inputs and outputs change over time. And we have, we can imagine some sort of anomaly score or how much each node's inputs and outputs are changing. Um, then the research question here becomes, you have this data flow graph and you have these scores um, and what we really care about is the downstream like ranking or predictions or something. And if that score is really high, 
I would like to do some sort of analysis to determine which nodes in the graph most influence right the last node or the node that the predictions node that we care about. Um, so I think at least for me, like thinking about this like graph-based causal nature nature of things, um, what are some like like some properties of this graph? For example, if um, a node in this graph actually didn't change very much, but a node before this graph changed a lot, I don't care too much um, because like the more downstream I go, if the error doesn't show up, which in a lot of machine learning cases, as you say, right, like they're very forgiving, models are forgiving. Uh, maybe I don't care about that corruption as much as I care about the corruptions that actually do impact the downstream performance. Um, so I, I guess the TBD, like I'll, the paper is under revision. I just submitted that. And then I'm also working on another one that's like a case study of this approach in recommender systems. Um, so, yeah. Um, so so that, that's great. Like maybe maybe before um, just like going further, I, I just wanted to add a comment. I think uh, the paper that Shreya was referring to earlier um, is a is a paper from uh, uh, Google several years back in Neurips. Uh, I think this is the paper Scully et al. Hidden technical depth in machine learning yeah. systems, right? Like yeah, uh, the changing the anything changes everything. But I think um, so that that principle and that phenomenon is very known. But I don't think that there are a lot of methods to really tackle practically, like uh, how do you quantify the impact that changing something has, especially because the nature of these pipelines is um, really annoyingly, like not every node is an ML model. You don't have any guarantees on the functions. Like you don't, you don't know what kinds of functions are being used in these transformations. Um, you can't, a lot of the times like, if you are doing monitoring for these kinds of pipelines, like you might not have even built the models yourself or even have control over um, certain models there. So how, how do you kind of do this in a bolt-on fashion, right? Like you don't know anything about the properties of the functions. You can't change them. You can't really change the data, but in some sort of way, you would like to identify uh, responsible components in the pipeline that are responsible for broken performance. Um, I think that's super interesting. Um, yeah, excited to release the paper. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I think uh, as you are describing this, it looks like uh, there may be even connections to say uh, the explainable AI, right? In, in the explainable AI, we often tend to think of there is some model and uh, there are inputs, right? Features feeding into the model. We want to understand which features are important having mm -hmm. an effect on the output of the model. So now we are, we are talking about many several machine learning systems stitched together and your one of the points, um, the insights that you mentioned was that if if the for the downstream task, if some model does not have an effect, right, or changes did not have an effect, then that's we don't care about that as much. Maybe yeah. maybe there may be interesting connections. Uh, totally. Yeah, I think so. But the, the nice thing about like traditional these like like Lyme approaches or these like permutation based. Uh, approaches to determine feature importance, like you have some sort of idea of the functions that you're evaluating. Like maybe it's like a tabular data problem with some sort of XG boost, right? You, you have the ability to like run the model function and to see outputs um, if you change the input slightly. You have all of these things, you know the nature of like most decision tree problems are like minimizing some sort of entropy somewhere. You, you kind of know that. Whereas if you zoom out, right, um, a lot of the components in the pipeline are not even ML based. Like, for example, I am standardizing data or I am joining data um, or I am reading in some other API from the internet and filling in other features or I'm doing some interpolation, right? So, um, yeah, the nature of these functions, if you think about the pipeline as an end-to-end -end function, right, is incredibly complex. You don't have, um, yeah, any insights or guarantees about what this function holds. Yeah, uh, uh, and, and things maybe get uh, worse if we also look at the interactions, right? In addition to this being more like a directed cyclic graph, right, or a mm -hmm. one direction, uh, in many real world systems, like, uh, Recommender systems. Uh, yeah. Recommenders, for instance, right? Like the output of the final model has an effect on 
the training data, yeah. the updated training data for even upstream models, right? Like uh, that makes totally. things even more uh, complex. Um, so let, let's let's uh, look at say even if you think of settings like that, uh, what may be some of the uh, uh, things to be cautious about, right? When there are these kind of feedback loops, what are the issues that might arise? Like what are the things that often may, may not be taken into account? Yeah, um, specifically in the case where you have these feedback loops, like tight, tight feedback loops, like one of my case studies is, or one of the collaborations is with like a very large scale recommender system. Um, the thing that they find the most important or the organization is putting the most focus on is some sort of data quality verification system. Um, and the first challenge with this was like defining data quality in some way. Uh, like what is an objective if you ask any person in the room, they should all be able to say, yes, this is high quality or no, this is no, there shouldn't be like some very variances in like what people think. So just defining that was a challenge. Um, and that first started with like coverages. Um, every feature column or every uh, input or output column, I'll call it just column for the remainder of this, they should have like a minimum 30% uh, coverage. So no more than 70% should be no. Um, that's a great start because it's binary, yes or no. I know that this is quality. And then iterating over time, right, you can refine the definition of quality. Um, maybe I don't want the means of these columns to drop too much or increase too much. Um, and I'll do some form of basic anomaly detection um, on this. Um, and that gets that, that jump from like coverage to any like numerical aggregation like that gets really challenging because. Um, not only are you determining like what's the statistic to aggregate, like mean, median, standard deviation, percentiles, whatever. And then all the uh, people are also using like all over the place, like two samples, tests, KL divergence, all like, I think about like any statistic, any scalar statistic. Um, you only, you have to fix that as well as figure out like what to compare. Um, so do I wanna to compare today's data to yesterday's data? Do I want to compare today's data to the rolling mean of seven days of last week's data? Do I want to compare it to just seven days ago's data? And all of these have different impacts, different organizations, even different teams at the same organization do this differently just because of the nature of the data and the problem. Like for a lot of time series problems, comparing to yesterday is kind of useless because there's just like weekly seasonality um, that's interesting. Uh, when it comes around to like holiday season, like 4th of July weekend happened recently, huge like problems with performance monitoring. Um, I, th I think like these kinds of uh, problems that don't have clear answers. And it just often ends up being like some executives making some decision somewhere and then everyone goes with it. Um, I, I don't know. I feel like there, there's a lot of interesting, like like how do we even go about making the processes to come up with this, right? I, I don't know, but yeah, to answer your original question, data validation, I think is like one of the key things for these like feedback loops, tight feedback loops. Um, and it gets, it starts really early to fit like, the challenges and coming up with these definitions of data quality. Yeah, yes, I, I think there are lots of um, uh, different nuances that you touched upon, right? Like, I think traditionally, the as we started discussing at the beginning, like often the aspiration is to, to make sure that the model is uh, uh, continuing to have high accuracy or AUC or whatever is the business metric of interest, but, but then, in many settings, there is a delayed labels, right? We don't get the true labels, if at all, even true labels are available until much later. So that's why we go start monitoring other aspects, right? The data input, data distribution, or prediction probability distribution. Uh, there also, like you highlighted, what is the baseline? Right? That itself is not often obvious. Uh, there may be seasonality or other patterns, right? Like, what, how do we go about doing that? Um, there's also uh, another uh, maybe related dimension of, um, if you think of feedback loops, there, there's also the aspect of a bias, right? Um, say, yeah, several years back, Microsoft launched a chatbot called Tay. Uh, this may have been back in 2014. Uh, and the way it was designed was uh, it would leverage the tweets uh, which are posted over the last several hours or several a, a day or so to kind of retrain itself. Um, so then once it was launched, people noticed that this could be easily um, 
like adversarially attacked they yeah. started tweeting about uh, say maybe um, uh, like uh, uh, say uh, things uh, red, 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 with which may not be considered appropriate and then just very quickly the chatbot started behaving in a racist manner uh, yeah. that, that's also another type of feedback effect right, that we have to be very uh, careful about totally i think um in the case of like the domain of bias is kind of known so for example you don't want your recommender sister your feed uh, recommender system model to recommend the same category of content over and over and over again like i've seen so like collaborations co co companies we're collaborating with will have some sort of like diversity model um somewhere downstream where they like prioritize having diversity in the feed somehow um to kind of like it's it's not so completely solving the problem but mitigating like people adversarially or just unknowingly the model converging to like one specific domain um but yeah, like coming up with these domains, right? It's like, mm -hmm. I don't know, how do you come up with it? Um, so, so let me just go back to um, yeah, your vision paper. Yeah, right? in, in this paper, you kind of touch upon um, three broad categories, like in terms of detection, uh, diagnosis, and a reaction to bugs in the machine learning pipelines once the model has been deployed uh, can you maybe go into some of the the key research challenges right the challenges along yeah. each of these dimensions totally um yeah so the detection diagnosis reaction framework has kind of like been iterated on through like several years of doing this kind of like monitoring and production pipelines um and one of the organizations we're working with is implementing that which is really cool um, so in detection, the key question, the, the question or objective there is um, when is model performance dropping? So just detecting some problem with the ML pipeline. And why is this hard? Right, because of the feedback delays. Um, maybe you don't know a ground truth, so you're like forced to monitor some other proxies for performance. Like maybe you're forced to monitor business like click through rate or something um, or like complaint rate. Um, and yeah, like figuring out some way to accurate, precisely monitor performance, definitely an interesting research challenge. Then in diagnosis, um, once you know that there's a drop, um, imagine that you have a snapshot of your pipeline. Can you determine which components or how much each component is misbehaving? Mm -hmm. um, so kind of what information do we need to be able to do a root cause analysis? And then finally, in reaction, it's um, which, if say I aggregate these diagnosis snapshots over time, so I look cross component over the last, I don't know, history of time, um, which components are most likely to cause the performance drop, and like where can I get the biggest bang for my buck if I basically go and fix an error or try to improve my data. Um, so that's kind of high level three prong framework and the research challenges. Um, well, yeah. okay. I guess I can talk about the research challenges next in there. So the detection is like lack of labels, I think is the biggest one. Um, second in diagnosis, um, the research challenges there are um, verifying or kind of like doing some sort of data validation for the input and output of every single component or quantifying how much these components are changing. How do you do this in an automated way without the user require having to like manually set thresholds for every column, tune these over time. Um, how do you optimize for good precision and recall, all sorts of things. And then finally in reaction is like, how do you do this quantifying of like these data validation? Like how do I do the data flow analysis? Um, how do I do this at scale? How do I aggregate this over time, et cetera? Um, so so uh, I recall in one of our, um... Uh, past uh, chats, uh, we discussed about even this kind of uh, trade-off between alert fatigue, right? Too many mm -hmm. alerts and maybe missing out on some alerts, right? Some kind of trade-off between false uh, positives and false negatives. Uh, is that yeah. also one of the issues here? Totally, totally. I think that's a big diagnosis issue. Like there's two things there. One is to avoid a practitioner having to enumerate thresholds for every single column. Like mm -hmm. A lot of people didn't even build the models they're monitoring 
Um, how are they supposed to know thresholds or like bounds for every single column? And then to um, making sure these are high precision, high recall alerts over time, right? As the data changes, um, we need our model or uh, not model, but we need our conception of these bounds or conception of data quality alerts to change over time, right? And so how do we automate both away from the users, keep it interpretable? Um, so maybe uh, in that context, let, let me um, just uh, say, uh, take one of the questions in the chat, which is kind of related. Um, there is a question about in model monitoring, uh, how can we contextualize human feedback in the loop? Mm -hmm. Um, so do you have thoughts on that? Like the, the reality is these systems don't exist in isolation, right? There are humans, well, different stakeholders, different personas. Uh, and how do we, what may be some of the thing, ways in which we can uh, bring in, to factor in the human aspect in this? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of ways you can interpret this question. One being like humans define ground truth labels. And I think one really low hanging fruit for a lot of organizations is like just trying to make sure you have some labels come in, some human reviewed annotated labels come in every couple of weeks or something. Um, just, yeah, like to solve this ground truth. It doesn't perfectly solve the ground truth problem, but it gives you better than nothing. Um, so that's one way. I think there's also another way to interpret this question on like measuring human engagement with the models and then making sure you have like for all of your customers, you have some like bare minimum metric you're achieving for them rather than just an aggregated holistic metric. Um, and I think that's a little trickier because like it's very customer specific and uh, organization specific, like there's like a lot of great anecdotes on how like Slack, for example, for a lot of their models have, has needed to, um, like for high paying users of Slack or organizations of Slack, like they just have teams dedicated to making sure those high paying um, organizations are happy. So, so I think that kind of like org stuff uh, is much more hand wavy. Uh, there's also the, the aspect of, uh, say, um, uh, like one is like related to what you described is bias, right? Like the model, yeah. if you look at just the metrics as a whole, it may look like the model is having high accuracy or the accuracy is just dropped by 0.5 percentage, but it might have been the case that that entire drop is in some demographic uh, yeah. subgroup. And so that's the, another reason why it's important to monitor not only the model's performance as, as a whole, but also for all relevant subgroups right yeah uh, and an interesting anecdote there too is like one of my project one of my papers is like an interview study paper where we interview a lot of like production ml engineers and that's hopefully coming out in a couple of months um but there are a lot of like applications that we have inter we've interviewed people in applications that are more to do with safety like their life or that situations like auto autonomous vehicles for example and um this kind of like metric monitoring is very different there because they don't care about holistic metrics as much as they care as like passing individual examples, like this hand curated data set of high stakes failure modes on the road. And they need to pass 100% of those. If the model performance regresses, the global model performance regresses, totally fine, but they cannot afford to fail in like a case where a pedestrian is walking from this angle or whatever. Um, I think that's also interesting because not all, like a lot of like, ranking models or like ad models, um, don't think about evaluation this way. Yeah, yes, I, I think that's a really interesting. It's more like is some, there may be some corner cases or special cases which are paramount, right? That those yeah. getting any, uh, making any mistakes or getting those settings wrong uh, is yeah. not acceptable. Uh, something similar that uh, we have um, encountered with uh, some of our customers is uh, in, in some settings, like say fraud detection, for instance, uh, there's a huge imbalance. Like the, the fraction of cases which are fra fraud would be very small compared to uh, the things which are not fraud, right? Hopefully that's the case. In, in those cases also, if you just monitor, let's say, uh, prediction probability distribution or uh, uh, data distribution overall, it's very easy to miss out if significant change is happening in this small um, minority of the fraudulent uh, cases. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. I'm a big fan of automated retraining for this reason. Like uh, a lot of people are, 
I think there's like a lot of interesting work around like how to mitigate this kind of concept drift, which like the nature of fraud changes. Mm -hmm. um, but there's how else do you do it without training a new P of Y given X? Like how you know P of Y of given X is changing unless you're making a new P of Y given X. So I think that's, yeah, huge yeah. fan of auto retraining. Yeah, yes, I, I think that that's that's like perhaps going even one step further. I was, I was referring to even this basic task of detection, right? Like sure. if, yeah. if you don't even have, um, if you don't account for the imbalance in classes, then totally. we may not even get to detect that such a change is uh, happening. Yeah, um, totally, totally. Uh, so, so uh, I think this like it looks like we can continue this discussion for uh, in, into the research domains for a long time. Yeah. Uh, let me go and uh, maybe uh, take some uh, questions from the Q and A. Um, so, one of the questions is like uh, we would love to hear your thoughts on uh, the tools and the landscape in general for ML ops. Um, uh, and maybe let me combine that with another uh, question, which is there are so many uh, ML monitoring toolkits and companies uh, that often may look like the same. How do we go about differentiating? How do, or more broadly, how do we pick the right tools, the right vendors, right uh, open source tools and whatnot for a given application setting? Oh, I don't have answers to this question. I think you are going to be better at answering the, like, how do you differentiate between the model monitoring tools? I don't know how to differentiate between them. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's not a good answer. Um, hot takes on tools and the landscapes. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I feel like I, every few months, look at the tools that are out there, try them out a little bit and since I'm not actually using them in practice, uh, I feel like I'm not the best person to ask. Um, yeah, yeah. It, maybe I can I can just comment on uh, like again selecting such tools right for <laughs> across the ML pipeline or ML ops, including model monitoring. Uh, I think it, it's a good idea to start with um, what are the the pain points, right? Pain points given the application setting. Uh, for instance, uh, is the setting one where there is just uh, models trained on uh, tabular data sets, right? tabular features, or is there also maybe uh, image or uh, sure. voice or video or NLP or other types of signals, right? Like, and in often we are starting to see the emergence of multimodal settings where there is both. There may be some features which are just structured like tabular features, and some features which may be freeform text or uh, videos or voice and so forth. So whether the, the tools are capable of handling more than one domain, right? If, if that's the need, uh, then another aspect might be um, what, are, what are the kinds of types of models? Is it uh, say uh, classification, primarily like classification settings or is it like uh, re re regression settings or rankings, uh, recommender systems? So I think that also, plays another role right? because like if if you think of some of the um, problems like they may they may be so uh, nuanced like this uh, the setting like the feed ranking or uh, conversational assistance and so forth there may be there may be several models some of them may be classification models some ranking uh, some might be uh, other types of models and these are all getting stitched together uh, or how do we go about again uh, handling or monitoring yeah, such kind of complex systems. Um, I think the the yeah, broader question to think about is a little bit non-technical. It's more of um, often, at least in my view, uh, uh, it's it's kind of if you take any of these problems, there are perhaps solutions out there. Um, often as part of open source toolkits, uh, but the one of the challenges is in integrating those right among several different open source toolkits, figuring out which one is the right one itself is challenging. And then uh, once we have decided on something, then figuring out how to configure the hyperparameters or other settings, uh, right? how to uh, tune those uh, systems if needed and how, how to integrate. I think that part is often, uh, maybe often missing. Uh, that's like, or in some, in cases where for your machine learning pipeline, you may have to combine more than one existing, so let's say open source toolkit, 
what are the interactions in what ways does what, this toolkit designed for say a machine learning experimentation interact with this toolkit designed for machine learning uh, model monitoring i think there are all those aspects also something to keep in mind uh, it's kind of broadly uh, goes to uh, often the build versus buy question in terms of uh, how much yeah, cost uh, in terms of the the human cost right the the number of data scientists or machine learning engineers and other teams uh, that are needed to both build and maintain some tool versus leveraging an existing uh, toolkit uh, which is maybe uh, commercially available and so forth i think there are again that i don't think there are there's a single answer for any of this it very much depends on the perhaps on the context uh, so let's maybe go into um, uh, another question, which is about it. Kind of relates to the 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 your four recent blog posts on uh, modern ML monitoring mess, right? So the question is, what do you see as the biggest problem in ML workflows? Uh, describe the current mess. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, ML is a very complex landscape. So I like to segment problems into the problem that 1% of organizations have. So the Googles, the Facebooks, um, LinkedIn's, their prop TikToks, their problems. And then there's a 99% of companies that are working with data. Um, what are their problems? And I think in the 1%, the former case, um, they are deploying ML for sure. Like people have ML in production pipelines, but um, they don't know like if something is going wrong, they don't know how to react. Engineers will spend weeks trying to fix those books. So I think the biggest problem there is how do you shorten that feedback loop? How do you give them the tools that they need to like quickly pinpoint, how to quickly diagnose and react to the books? If they've solved detection, they have not solved diagnosis and reaction. Um, I think the 99% of companies to be, the other 99% to be completely honest, I think a lot of them are still focused on like, how do you collect the data set to just train the initial model? Um, I, the, my friends at like Snorkel, AI talk about this a lot. Like they, they thought that they they're starting this company. They thought that they're going to go in and like everyone's going to have ML pipelines productionized within six months. Uh, not the case at all. People are just now starting to peek at their data in Snowflake. They're wondering what kinds of models to train. Just having that kind of knowledge and expertise and those processes to figure out what tasks to solve solve with ML and just how to even get that first model developed. Um, I think that is like one of the biggest workflow issues for like the 99% that tail. Um, and I, I think that's also why like in ML ops, right? Like the companies that are doing really, really well right now are well known or like the labeling companies, the um, experimentation platforms, the experiment tracking companies slash tools, like uh, everybody, like ML flow is a great example of like a lot of people adopting it. Um, yeah, those are, those are the current pain points now. I suspect in a few years, like the modeling, the monitoring pain point will be there uh, for that 99%. Um, but yeah. Oh, so, so just to add to that, I think uh, so if, you, if you think of even uh, the hidden technical depths paper, right? The, the mm -hmm. paper kind of highlighted the fact that in, in real world machine learning, the, the fancier parts, right? The machine learning model training or maybe mm -hmm. thinking of uh, features, new features, and uh, that is a very small part. And the rest of uh, everything surrounding that, the sy systems aspects, right? M model monitoring or machine learning pipeline tracking, data preparation, data quality, cleaning, cleaning of the data, all those are often the more challenging and take up a lot of time. Uh, so to some extent, uh, something to think about is, some of these are often undifferentiated, right? If you think of, let's say, a company in the healthcare space or uh, in the financial services space uh, or uh, any other domain, right? hiring domain and so on, or manufacturing, uh, that's th this kind of these undifferentiated aspects are not really the the bread and butter or DNA of the company, right? Like so, that's where leveraging uh, available uh, mechanisms, right? available uh, toolkits for these undifferentiated parts and that will free up the data scientists and the the uh, science researchers engineers to focus on what is kind of domain specific the application specific aspects 
Um, so along uh, those uh, those lines, I think um, uh, there's some thought ahead. Okay, anyways, uh, I'll, yeah, if I remember, I'll, I'll just uh, say that again. Uh, so one of the, uh, another question that we see here is uh, from Abhishek um, on what are your thoughts about ML security in model monitoring? Uh, for example, preventing uh, I believe model hacking yeah, I think this is different for different applications. I don't focus on this too much in my research. Um, I think there are certain ML tasks and organizations that are more susceptible mm -hmm. to model hacking. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I don't have great thoughts on that either. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so maybe uh, some yeah, uh, some some kind of comment I can add is um, so. Uh, sometime uh, about a year back while I was at the AWS machine learning team, we were kind of briefly starting to look into this problem. Like how do we, uh, how do we address adversarial attacks on machine learning systems? Um, so initially, like we had an intern project and we started focusing on uh, model hacking in the sense of reverse engineering the model. Um, we start, we, we, we are trying to see whether we can uh, come up with maybe uh, mechanisms to detect whether, say, a model is being reverse engineered. Uh, we, we spoke to a number of customers and we started realizing that more than the model hacking or reverse engineering of the model, uh, often the, the bigger interest is in uh, seeing whether somebody is trying to figure out the uh, loopholes or failures of the model. Uh, the, the idea is that they often want to craft adversarial examples, right? The examples where the model will misbehave. That's what often the attackers are trying to figure out. They're not necessarily trying to reverse engineer the model, but instead want to uh, find out what, what are the uh, failure modes of the model. Uh, so that that is something that organizations often want to uh, ideally prevent at the least detect whether somebody is trying to do that. Uh, we did uh, work further on that and we have a paper in uh, the ICML conference happening just right now uh, on how to go about detecting uh, such kind of adversarial attacks by leveraging uh, several queries issued by the same same entity instead of just looking at each queries in isolation. There's a rich literature, rich emerging field on adversarial attacks in general. Oh. Um, so let, let me move on to uh, a question about um, what are the some of the key metrics by which a model is measured uh, versus the initial setup in order for a business to know it's failing, uh, notwithstanding the latencies in getting ground truth, and especially in the context of what it's set up to do, whether it's a recommended system, scoring, and so forth. Okay, this is a good question. Um... Okay, so I think the first thing is understanding pretty deeply, like what are the production ML metrics and what are the development ML metrics. So one great example of a difference is in development, data scientists will train models, for example, for classification and measure AUC, or they will measure some aggregate metric over various different um, instances of a threshold or various different thresholds. Um, and this is great for evaluating model like predictive power or like a family of models. Um, but at the end of the day, when you deploy this model, you are not going to deploy it in uh, infinity different universes with different thresholds. You are probably going to pick a threshold that is classif classification spam or not spam. You, you're, maybe that's 50%. Maybe you, the bottom line is you're gonna pick some point on your ROC curve and you're going to put a vector of predictions into production. You're not gonna put them all, you're gonna put a vector of predictions into production, and then you need to monitor some loss over that vector of predictions. Uh, so I think a lot of people will, so for example, for class, highly class imbalanced problems or something um, where just having low positive examples will mean like various points on the ROC curve will change a lot even if the AUC, which is the area under this curve, doesn't change very much. And then they will put, so, so that means the production ML performance will change a lot, but the development ML performance doesn't change, if that makes sense. So I think sitting down deeply and thinking about like, what are the metrics? How do they differ um, with the nature of my problem? Like that's super, super important. 
Um, so I think that answers the first part. I don't remember the second part of the question. Um, so, uh, so, uh, 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 yeah, I, I don't uh, recall either, but let, let me just add some comment on uh, maybe the spirit of the question. Uh, I, I think the, the, the question seems to be about like often there is latencies in collecting the ground truth right so okay. what may be ways around that um so i think one okay. approach i have i have seen is uh say let's let's say that we don't have access to ground truth labels but we have a reason to uh, we, we have some kind of um maybe other variables with which we can do say pro propensities matching or scoring between the the actual observed data points and the uh, the training data points uh, for for example let's say suppose that we make an assumption that um, the the model uh, the age is a factor right let's say the model was trained on some proportion of uh, ground truth the samples and now in uh, in uh, production the distribution of the age of the people on which we are making predictions is different so what these approaches then do is they they divide the training data by say this uh, metric uh, the, uh, dimension of interest like age and look at the the accuracy for each different age buckets and then extrapolate and assume that for the production for each of those age buckets the accuracy will still be retained and since now the distribution of age is different in production so by kind of uh, doing a convex combination or combining those accuracies kind of estimate what's the what's like the likely accuracy in production um, so another approach which is uh, 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 taking uh, getting some traction is uh, since we cannot measure often measure accuracy in re real time or even near real time, we look at proxies. We, one proxy might be the distribution of the prediction probabilities. Uh, another proxy might be the distribution of the features or the data that is fed into the model. Uh, if these are changing, there is a good reason to think that the model may not be behaving as intended. Uh, yet another one is uh, looking at the explanations, the feature attributions uh, uh, over time. If, if the feature attributions are changing, or in other words, the, the features that are most important for the model are ch changing over time, that may also be a cause for concern. Uh, this was highlighted in a, a blog post from uh, Google uh, several months back, how monitoring feature attributions helped save some significant uh, issues with one of the ML systems. Um, so let me uh, move on to uh, the next question, which is what are the, some of the best practices uh, that my machine learning team need to consider for uh, model monitoring? Uh, for example, consideration of the ML lifecycle and continuous monitoring so that models do not decay. Yeah, um, so I think like exactly what you're saying about trying to figure out the labels or estimate performance when in the absence of the labels is really important. Like, I think the method you're describing is also like in the stats literature is known as importance weighting. So how do you bin your training set into appropriate clusters and then at inference time classify your data point into that cluster and then average or aggregate the training accuracies appropriately? Um, that's one. Then I think another uh, big way to do monitor another important thing in monitoring um, is to have some sort of guarantees on all of your features within your organization so do data validation um, there's this good paper from google data validation um, a data validation paper from google by eric breck at all um, and they describe like kind of the checks that they use um, as well as sebastian shelter from university of Amsterdam has the DQ paper, or I think this was like a precursor to DQ, um, but that paper on like 25 different checks that you should have for every column in your data, like completeness, um, like whether some of these checks should be like making sure some feature is monotonically increasing, like age, for example, um, stuff like that, definitely embedding into your system is super important. I would say that the data validation is probably the most important in some way, especially as the organization increases in size. Um, so, so what are the uh, so uh, another uh, question uh, uh, which which kind of relates to something we discussed earlier was uh, what are the downsides of automated uh, retraining, uh, especially when done without understanding what changed in the data or concepts or 
or perhaps let's say by the term automated without sufficient human oversight yeah so um the biggest downside i've seen on automated retraining is like this massive ops burden that is carried so suppose i do retraining every day and like yesterday's data got corrupted in some way yesterday's data ingestion so that means yesterday's data feature set training data set also got corrupted and so the model that's trained is also corrupted so now we get into this crazy feedback loop of just corrupted data after corrupted data um and just managing that ops is like uh, have, we're very burdensome right um so that's i think like the biggest thing that i see in practice is like once the data goes off the rails like forever your model and like that entire loop is just going off the rails and this is also pronounced a lot in like recommender systems um i think another downside for the automated retraining is um especially in like organizations with like higher turnover um it's it's like this like voodoo magic sort of thing to figure out what's the cadence to retrain your model and oftentimes this is not even justified so um adding this kind of complexity into the pipeline when somebody new is onboarded or the person who determined this leaves causes a lot of questions for the new people and then of course they don't want to touch something because it's already in production they don't want to fix it or change it um so kind of just like having this bespoke knowledge there and people unable to change it or understand it is also kind of a downside of this that i've seen oh, so if you if you think of even our auto retrain pipelines uh, do we want do we typically want to retrain our at a regular cadence right after some amount of time or do we want it to be a function of alerts right, when with some alerts or some issues triggering the retraining or both um i think like if you're able to have very precise high precision high recall alerts that trigger the retrain retrain then that would be ideal but i don't know anybody who has high precision high recall uh, alerts a lot of people have a ton of false positive alerts um the other downside of having this like a trigger based retrain um is that like whenever there's a bug um in the production pipeline you don't really know the last time that it was trained and you probably have to do some searching and some finding to figure that out whereas if you knew it was automatically retrained um that's just easier to cognitively manage right so a lot of the thing is like ops and organizational problems um what's easier for the biggest group of people to, what's the least overhead for the entire team of debugging people to know um so, so something kind of related to um, auto retraining uh, is around say detecting versus addressing uh, issues right like so the spirit of the question is uh, is this is the problem of addressing the irregularities or issues something that is applicable for maybe a very small fraction of the companies let's say the fang or stale tech companies or is it broadly applicable is it is is it also relevant for companies in other domains other industries well like is what part relevant like the uh, the addressing oh. part like not just detecting oh, issues but I also think. figuring out how to the okay. diagnosis so, and uh, reaction parts detection is like a different magnitude problem in different tasks and organizations right for like for all of recommender systems detection is less of a problem than like um fraud detection and like credit card companies or something that like requires the human to go and look into it whereas like getting like automated feedback from the user of your product um so i think like the fang companies just happen to have a lot more ml models in production that have this near immediate feedback like ads models and like content recommender systems have the user will click on it or they won't click on it and immediately they'll know this um so i'm not yeah i i think it's just more of the nature of the problems that detecting is less of an issue for fang style companies than it is like like for example i a self driving cars is an example of like detecting is a huge problem for these autonomous vehicle companies and they're still large companies um but it's because like when you have these like on the road self driving car failures a human is like well, there are lots and lots of humans that are like sitting there and annotating like which cases are failure cases and then surfacing that back to the ml teams um so detection is a big problem for them 
Yeah, yes, uh, I, I think that's, that's kind of a re really insightful to say in general, what I've seen is uh, often the, the large tech companies are a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of uh, looking into, say, mm -hmm. machine learning pipelines or model monitoring and so forth. Uh, but the rest of the industry, right? especially uh, if you think of financial services, healthcare, hiring, and so on, they are manufacturing and uh, energy and so forth. There are they're starting to adopt more and more of machine learning models now. So the the challenges that the large tech companies ran into maybe uh, now they ran they're running into now or even a couple of years back is something that uh, other companies are starting in, to run into right now or in the near future so it's it's there is a it's often a matter of time but, but not not necessarily like that it's not applicable for some some of these organizations um the, i think this is a great a fantastic discussion um uh, uh, shreya would, do, do you have any uh, last comments like suggestions for the audience right what are the given that the audience is mostly machine learning practitioners what are the things that they can do oh man i don't have any i mean this was really fun yeah do val do data validation uh make sure you know what is going inside and outside of your models i think that's super important <laughs> my only big suggestion uh, sounds great I, I think this is a great uh, discussion uh, uh thank to all the attendees for the uh, the insightful questions which made us also think about this problem further and uh, thanks uh, Shreya for uh, uh, your time and uh, giving lots of uh, insights today and looking forward to following up with the attendees with uh, with I think the links to the recorded video and perhaps even maybe links to some of the papers and the articles that we discussed uh, thank you everyone awesome yeah thanks so much for having me